Ron Cole went off and he had to find the, the tour. And that was an eye-opener for me because I had heard Bean, as he was called. Incidentally, so I just read an article in one of the papers, and they said they call him Beans. I said they got to leave that S off. You know, the, the writers, they, they, they don't know. They write what they passed on information. But they should go to the sources that are still alive and get the true uh, stories. Yeah. That's okay. But uh, as long as they're writing, you know, and I'm just honored to be here with Joe, who's a good friend of mine. We've been playing together and hanging in a lot of places around the world, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I love your book. Yeah, the awesome. book is the book is fabulous. So oh. great to, to read about uh, Philadelphia scene and cats that you came up with and see it in a certain way, knowing the recordings and uh, the timeline of that. Yeah, so a few of us left from the Philadelphia Jazz and me and Benny Goldson. Because Ray Bryant passed away, Train, you know, Johnny Coles, Trumpeter, uh, you know, a couple of the younger ones than I, uh, McCoy China and uh, Kenny Barron, they're still around. But Kenny had a brother who played tenor also, named Bill Barron, who was older than Kenny, who was uh, very talented. So there are a lot of people who uh, could play in this world, what I always say, no one person has a monopoly on the music. So everybody can get some. For well, some of them took up a lot of it. John Cole saying he grabbed a big, a big uh, ability to, you know, but there's a lot of people who could play I met in my life that nobody here ever heard. There was a guy in Philadelphia who played the tennis saxophone named Jimmy Oliver, who was about my size and very dark skinned. We call him Satin Doll. And the Satin Doll, me and Train and Benny Golson would go to hear him because he could kick all our butts. Um, uh, Claire Daly and I, with the great baritone saxophonist who's teaching here, we, uh, we were recollecting a couple years ago. We were, about three or four years ago, we were at the Tri-C Jazz Festival. And uh, Jimmy came with, with uh, our opportunity to play and to speak. And we would stay up, we stayed up with you until 4.30 in the morning hearing stories. And we came back down at breakfast to hear more. It was incredible. And you just keep going and going. So, you know, sometimes this kind of social part is really something else. I, I had the great fortune of doing a really really great fortune of doing this really long tour a couple years ago with Joe Lovano, with John Schofield, Matt Pittman. We had long plane rides because we were going to Australia. And we sat around and I would just, we would, we would just tell stories about the scenes. So I think it's something really great to talk about is the regional scenes that we have, that we're recognized. And I think people now, I think we could, uh, in your area, we could, each of your towns and whatever, we could start to create those kinds of scenes again of supporting each other and experimenting with the music. I mean, in your book, you know, I think it was so great how you, you did all these sort of workshop things in your basement, writing music and having people play it in your big band and really putting it out there. I think that's really important to do, so. The community fun. that you come up with is so important and the relationships uh, with everyone is, is what uh, has always driven my passion, you know? And growing up the way I did, understanding this multi-generational thing that happens in music and the multicultural exchange that happens. Uh, you, you just kind of, you get captured and, and you learn from everyone else's experiences. Especially when you're around cats who are telling some stories on their instruments and playing from such an honest place in the music. And I, I feel really fortunate. I kind of caught the tail end of that corner tavern kind of thing that happened all around this country. And I think in every town, there was, there was uh, groups of players 
that just played for the love of the music. You know, I mean, my dad was a barber also and had, you know, to support the family. He didn't have the crazy ambitions that I did to go to New York and uh, to try to deal with people like Mr. Heath here. You know, uh, all of a sudden, you know, you realize at some point, like, you're in your hero's audience. Be in Jimmy Heat's audience. Please let's hear from Dr. Lonnie Smith. Real. Come on. First here in the and to be there. And then as time goes on, all of a sudden, they're in your audience. Currently going on in our artist talk. You know, I, I, I got the gig, I was playing with the Woody Herman Band in the uh, late 70s. I was in my early 20s. And we played in Germany, and we played this festival in Berkhausen. And Dexter Gordon was there. And Dexter... He played the first set, and it was just amazing to be there, you know, in his audience. Uh, I had heard him at the Vanguard prior to that also, but uh, his first few times being in the room with Dexter was something else. The sound, you know, when you hit a low C on the horn, man, it hits you in the back of the room, you know. Anyway, later that night there was a jam session after our set, and uh, I went to sit in and play. And I went up there and I looked out and Dexter was sitting at a table, like a couple of tables right from the stage. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know. <laughs> I think, I'm not sure. The first time we were together was in Brussels. Uh -huh. We were playing with somebody we played in Bruxelles. Uh-huh, could have been, yeah. In Belgium. So we run into each other uh, on the road all the time now as it is as the traveling musicians. You know, people in the other countries in the world like our music better than some of our people here in America. And uh, so we have to keep traveling. We play it where it is wanted. You know, we have to go where we are wanted. I was supposed to go to Serbia in November and I ain't I had to get the map to find out where Serbia is. <laughs> I haven't played in Serbia, no. I'm going to Ljubljana. Oh, though. I've been. <laughs> I've been, yeah. <laughs> you played uh, the Philippines and all those crazy. Matt and I, yeah, last year when we did this tour with John, we played some places I had never been. We played in Seoul, Korea, in Manila. You didn't play uh, Taichung? No, we didn't get the time. Well, Chung. we played in Taichung. Oh, with the band. And uh, uh, we went into Taipei, tai Taipei Airport, and then we went by bus to Taichung, mm -hmm. and it's a resort place. And we played there, uh, and there were 22,000 Chinese people, of course, natives, out there in the audience, we played three days there, and it was 22,000 every night. And what happened was uh, we had to do a master class, and uh, we supposed to be number one, right, in the world? Forget it. <laughs> anyway, we had this master class, and a little Chinese girl says, Mr. Heath, when are the Americans going to learn to speak Chinese? <laughs> I want to hide. He's going to be number one in the world. Oh, yeah? And you know we're borrowing money from him. But anyway, <laughs> China, going to Taichung was a quite an experience that I'll never forget. One of the, Antonio Hart, who's playing with me tonight, uh, was playing, and the little girl wrote, said, Mr. Hart, when you play, it touches me. Ten year old, and brought it up and gave him that note. He, oh, he couldn't believe it. See, now, now that's a, a, a lesson to be learned in our country. We can go somewhere, and I've heard recordings with the great Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, and it'd be ten people in the club clapping after they get through playing a symphonic excerpt or some music of the highest order. Two people clap. 
So what, the, what that says is we have to educate here our people about the music in the schools. When we were doing classes in New York, was sponsored by the Jazzmobile organization, uh, we went in the public schools. And some of the kids say, oh, it's good to have you in here playing jazz because all they send in here once in a while is classical string quartets. <laughs> you're training in European music, but you're not training people in African-American classical music. American, <laughs> never mind the African if that bothers you. American's classical music. Yeah. Can't say much other than you dig, right on. You dig. <laughs> NEA Jazz Master too, by the way. We had the, Mr. Haynes here yesterday, another NEA Jazz Master, which I find it in your book you talk about that. They talk about canceling that. The NEA Jazz Masters. Everybody should write the accomplishment. Because if they give uh, money, I, I wrote online about it. If they're giving money every year, I've been on several panels in my life, New York State Council of the Arts and other panels. And uh, I found that we're giving money to hundreds of symphony orchestras all over this country every year. Our government. I pay a whole bunch of taxes. And I expect that they give some money to to Joe Lovano as a jazz master. Because he has a receiver. My brother has a receiver. And we're talking about canceling the NEA jazz masters. Now, when Dizzy and Ornette Coleman and people got it, it was probably $5,000. I think when Roy Haynes got it, it may have been 10. When I got it, it was 20. And I told them people, I said, this is ludicrous. You give me $20,000 for a Life Achievement Award? Get out of here. <laughs> so the next year, they went up to 25. <laughs> so the last year, they just had it. Everybody who got it got 25. But I mean, just the, the respect is what we want. The respect. We're going to work for our money. But it's nice if you could get the respect from your government as an artist. I think that's why things are happening more all around the world because there is uh, support for the arts and for this amazing music all over Scandinavia and all in the European countries. Uh, and that's what funds a lot of these tours that uh, sustain us through the years. I think we should also, I'd like to mention that both these gentlemen are, are premier educators, teaching artists in their own right. I mean, Jimmy was at Queens College for many years. Uh, Joe was at the Berkeley School of Music as an artist in residence there. I mean, what a gift for those students from both these gentlemen, everybody that has come through. I know the Queens College legacy, Antonio Hard, Jeb, all these great musicians, and the people that Joe was touching. Uh, it's amazing, so I think we should give them a round of applause for their efforts for that too. The team that's working right now is, is such a, uh, an amazing international scene. There's a handful of players from the States. Like, yeah. Really. Yeah. In compared. Sports, in compared. Sports, sports, sports. Sports. Well, sports are important too. Well, you know. Not the way we do it here in this country. Yeah. Gotta have more music, you know? It's crazy. I hate to say it, but I, I can't help it. It's still passion. I understand. I think. Uh, <laughs> I think I, I read a statistic, I may be wrong, but I think the, the, the middle, middle class taxpayer, a portion of, of 25 cents of their money goes to the National Endowment. Something really pretty weird, weird figure that you wouldn't think. So it's only a, so how much of that is the NEA Jazz Masters if you divide that up? So I think they should get 20 grand a year for every year that they've been doing this. <laughs> Did you get back pace when they raised it the first year? I raised it? I asked the guy, can I get my five grand retroactive? Yeah, no. They said no, Mr. Yeah. <laughs>
I was going to ask you something, Joe, because your father was the barber. He, he, I think you told me this. In the, he had a Hammond B3 at the barber shop. There was a B3 in his shop. <laughs> yeah, sure, because they would have rehearsals and also just pull the curtain down and play. Yeah. Get a haircut and play the blues, man. <laughs> could you, uh, Jimmy, could you talk about your, I, I your brothers are, were, Percy was so special, obviously, and, and Tootie's a great friend and funny, one of the funniest people I've ever been around. Yeah. If you can see a YouTube clip of I'm playing drums in a sling and he's singing um, Route 66, I think you have to be over 18 to watch the particular clip, but no, he's funny. He's, he's incredibly funny and incredibly talented. And I think the, that you and the Jones family are two of the, I mean, really, the, the, the reigning families of jazz. I mean, it's like pretty amazing. Wow. What you guys, how much you guys each individually have contributed, and, and as a family also. Well, that's a, a three, three in the family. I mean, because there are a lot of twosomes. Yeah. You know, the Adelies, the Breckers from the Philadelphia. Brothers. You know, there are a lot of two, two brothers. But three, I mean, there's probably you, some others. You and the Joneses? Yeah, but the Joneses were, we were, we were similar too, because Hank was the gentleman, uh, you know, he wore a tie to the supermarket. <laughs> and Thad was the writer and orchestrator like me. Percy's the gentleman in my family. And he was so ivy dyey, you know. Uh, and, uh, and then Elvin and Tootie are similar. They're kind of wild. <laughs> Comedic. <laughs> also, but uh, I think I'm very fortunate in that, see Percy, when he first started, <laughs> he was playing the violin in junior high school, and uh, it wasn't too hip to be a violinist in the ghetto <laughs> and being named Percy <laughs> and being small and skinny. <laughs> So then he got in the Air Force and became a Tuskegee Airman, which a lot of people don't know, second lieutenant. But when he got out of the service, he said he was going to play bass. But he couldn't play good enough in my band. I had Nelson Boyd, who uh, Miles wrote the song Half Nelson for. So he, he got some lessons and he ended up being on more records than I'm on, probably. Uh, Percy, he has a bassist in the Modern Jazz Quartet for 47 or 48 years, you know, and John Lewis encouraged him to be a uh, snob. <laughs> <laughs> because when he got back with the Heath brothers and he started playing what I call the baby bass, which was a thing that Ray Brown created uh, that was strung up like a bass fiddle, but it was a cello body. Mm -hmm. So I call it the baby bass. When Percy would play that, on the gigs with the heat club, he would play some blues. Because he was the one in the family born in North Carolina. So he had blues in his shoes. <laughs> See, but when he was with the Modern Jazz Quartet, I be daddy, John Lewis would not let him play that. <laughs> no, he had to... You know, I mean, I appreciate it because they crossed, crossed over. And I used to argue with Percy about it. Don't I say? He said, "Well, James, you know, I got a son in Tumay that wrote a lot of hit songs, and I used him on one of our CB, a couple of our CBS records, because I'm trying to get to some young people." Oh, I, Percy, I don't want to play that stuff, man. Put that stuff on a loop, playing the same line over and over. All he wanted to play, doom, 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 what? So you know. He, he, I thought, he, he said, I ain't gonna play that crossover. I said, well, what is your music? You're crossing over Western classical. Because uh, the MJQ sound like Bach. <laughs> and Bach. If they didn't have Milk Jackson, there wouldn't have been no Bach. It would have just been Bach. <laughs> so I said, you cross over too. So brothers will argue. And me and him used to argue a lot. <laughs> and we got a picture on an album cover uh, called Brotherly Love. And I'm looking at Percy like this. And he's looking down at me. 
But that's a family thing. I loved him. He was a great musician. And my brother, too, he is now. How, how can you discount a person who recorded with John Coltrane, played with Lester Young, played with Sonny Rollins, played with the Jazz Tet, with Art Palmer and Benny Golson, and he played with Frederick Gould, the, the Beethoven yes. expert from Austria. He played with everybody, and he's not a jazz master because they're going to cut it out. Mm. You dig? And that's not fair, especially when we all are paying taxes <laughs> to high heaven. You know what I'm, I'm paying a lot of taxes. <laughs> I know you are too out there, right? Yes. So we should be respected as uh, contributing something to America. Especially the way you, just speaking about Percy and, and MJQ and your music and the, the cross-cultural things that are happening that brought it into the world of music today. Jazz and what, what we experience uh, as musicians the highest form. You know, I mean, Charlie Parker, I saw him with the uh, uh, Stravinsky's Firebird Suite mini score in his pocket, dizzy. We all uh, relate harmonically to European classical music, but that's not American music, it's European. <laughs> it's imported music. <laughs> and I think our music is important music. <laughs> I listen to Frederick Delius on my, in my, you know, I love that, you know. I, I listen to Western classical music, I'm inspired by it. But America created, and they, you know, Louis Armstrong and those people, Duke Ellington, you got to give them props. We have to. And all the people that's playing the music, and that's all cross-culture. The people, I went to Lima, Peru in the 80s with the we call U.S. Information Agency tour when Jimmy Carter was president. We went for three weeks to, in South America. And I went to Lima, Peru, and I'm in the hotel, and there's a guy in there with the nose like, bent like this, Inca. <laughs> and he's playing all Coltrane's licks. <laughs> this music went all over the world. And everybody in the world realizes that this is something important that was created in America.